Hello. You've had a shave. How are you doing, Chris? I'm no, I had a shave, yeah. I did have Something. a shave earlier in the week, but I did have a special. I thought, you know, should I, shouldn't I? I don't know. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I, I've tried to have a shave, but it, it, somehow my children are conspiring against me in half term. And every time I actually um, am about to do something that's focused on me, like a shave, um, one of them pops up with yet another demand. Don't we just love our kids, especially at half term? Um, anyhow, um, <coughs> good to see you, mate. Um, and thanks for uh, taking the time today. Apologies for me That's right. being, being a tad late. Uh, probably be late for my own funeral, I imagine. Um, but uh, <laughs> gag, gags aside, um, I, I always, whenever I see you, Stuart, I just, the, the one question I've been burning to ask you is, is that chair an actual throne? Or no, it's not. No, it's, a, it's like a room divider, right? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Uh, yeah. Not not even an actual chair. You're standing, right? You're not sitting. Yeah, yeah. That's um, See, that's Anthony's that's got it all straight, straight away. He's you just blown that. Chris's mind. He's a like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 are you actually are you standing up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you stand up? It's healthier. Sitting um, is the new cancer, uh, new smoking or whatever. There's a know? bit of that. <clears throat> yeah. Really? You can, it goes up and down. My table, on top of my table, there's another table that goes up and down. Yeah, yeah, I can so. sit down if I want, but most of the time, you know, you have lunch, you sit down, you watch telly, you sit down. So now I'm stand up. And like, another, I find it oh, helps me project I, my voice better as well. Oh, okay. And another scientific sort of reasons as to why you should stand up more. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're kind of designed that way. <laughs> good point but there you go I've, uh, that's the first thing i've learned already on this this podcast so yeah we'll look into it and, then, and a desk that lets you do that it's just 130 quid no ikea or i know it's um i don't know what brand it is it's something cheaper than the the sort of established recognized one but it seems to do the job so Stuart, this is your life we have 45 minutes to hear about the magical Mr. Nickel and right. all of the great things that you've done um, would probably be a, a good starting point because a number of the people on the podcast, podcast, however which way you want to view fun stars and found stars, um, haven't probably heard of you or, or know you. So I think a great starting point because we personally know you um, for, for the work that you've done for Notwix. If you could maybe give us a, an intro as to Quantex, Stuart, life in general, where you are, but we can subdivide that into many questions over the podcast, I hasten to add. So yeah, let's just kick off and maybe give a bit of background, sure. Stuart, it'd be great. Well, I'll go from now backwards, and when that gets too long, you can raise your hands or squawk at me or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so at, at the moment, I'm, I'm we're having this call from uh, South Devon, which is my home, um, and I'm helping with a group of friends, partners, uh, raise a fund called Quantex, Q A N T X, which is a, a regional fund. We're hoping it's going to be an enterprise capital fund. So we with BBB support um, to invest in high growth businesses in the greater southwest of England. Um, and we can, we can discuss what we're specifically looking for uh, in a bit. Um, in addition to that, as you know, I help you uh, introduce some companies to funding via Notwix. And I am also mentor for the Royal Academy of Engineering um, for people from uh, emerging economies. Morning hours with two um, Vietnamese, who have, um, they all have uh, sustainable development goal businesses. And so uh, there are different stages of development. Um, and then this afternoon, I have four Kenyans, um, all a myriad of different businesses who, who I'm, I'm hopefully um, helping them move forward. Uh, other work I do is I'm a trustee for Heropreneurs, which is a charity from people from the armed forces community who want to set up and grow their own businesses. Um, and that could be spouses, veterans, serving, dependents, 
um, the, the sort of broad mix. Uh, and at the moment, I've got three mentees um, that I'm mentoring on a pro bono basis with them, as well as sort of trying to improve the, the whole structure of what we do. Yeah. Wow. So that and four kids and a dog. Um, Busy man. Where do yeah. you find the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of it is complimentary. And, it, you know, if you're doing... If you're doing work on, I don't know, how to set the right price for a product and you're revising your you know, knowledge on that, then that can filter through to all my all my mentees um, and, you know, my own business. So. Okay, great. Good start, Stuart. Um, the life before Devon, I seem to believe you were residing in London. Did, did you start yeah. your investment yeah, so, um, here? So we were in London till 2010, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, usual kind of places. And we, we arrived in London uh, in 98. Um, so before 98, I was in the army. I was an officer in the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, um, the thin red line of a historical note. Um, uh, and then when I came out of the military, the, the only place that would give me a sensible kind of opportunity really was London. Um, so we moved, moved down here. Uh, and then I worked in, in corporate finance initially. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd met some guys from 3i just as I was leaving the army. And I thought, wow, this is a really interesting job and these seem like good people. And why can I do that? And they kind of said, well, no, you've not been to Oxbridge and you've not had first time passes in your ACAs. But, you know, let's have a chat anyway. So we had a chat um, and that led me to be the structured finance or corporate finance. Um, and then I got a job in corporate finance. And then they said, oh, you're going to need some additional qualification. So then I did a part time master's at London Business School in finance. And then, uh, you know, around dot com time, I moved into venture capital proper. And I've kind of most of the most of my time has been spent doing that since. And, and was, was Octopus Ventures involved in that, that whole? Yeah, so I, I, the, the first time I guess proper VC job was with YFM, uh, doing a regional fund for, for London for early stage companies called a capital fund, um, which has got a lot of similarities to what we're trying to do in Devon. And I think people forget, you know, London, even post.com wasn't a place where the word entrepreneur was known. Um, <clears throat> and there wasn't much activity really. Um, so then we, I, I did 14 investments there over five years and then moved on to Octopus where I was also there for five years. Um, yeah. And, good, and good at Octopus, what was your, what was your focus at Octopus, Stuart? Uh, yeah, so we, um, Octopus had, had raised, um, 45 million pounds for a, a venture capital trust, um, with the plan that it would take less risk than normal venture capital trusts. Um, and that was my kind of mission was to invest that. Um, and I worked out we could effectively take uh, mezzanine risk using equity. Um, and we invested in, in, in a lot of, you know, relatively safe businesses, but we got a, a high return relative to the risk that we took. Um, we left, you know, uh, sort of good relationships with with all those entrepreneurs. For uh, for for the lay people listening um, who may not know, what what would you? How would you explain mezzanine risk through equity? Yeah, well, first of all, I think the word mezzanine is kind of toxic to entrepreneurs because it sounds a bit technical. Um, so I used to call it flexible debt, which people could get a handle on. So the idea was I was taking more risk than a bank would but less risk than the equity investors would. And I was wanting a return, you know, commensurate with that. Um, so that might be going into a business that was a, a buy and build um, at a relatively early stage and being the, the senior debt in that. And then as the business developed, allowing bank debt to sit ahead of us if something went wrong. Um, so I could maintain a, a decent um, uh, return on my investment. And typically taking a small amount of the equity relative to the amount of funds we were offering. The, the sort of the UK's version of the Mitchell stats, these were decent, good, you know, engineering and other types of businesses that 
got on with their work and um you know one one made um they like to call it industrial fasteners but to you and me nuts and bolts but they made specialist ones for for the oil and gas industry and things like that you know and they're, they're still doing that so i mean uh, uh, for, was, for some uh, people a show for, business. for some people that might sound a bit like venture debt is that kind of similar and were you ahead of the curve on that um I guess a lot of these businesses were were making profits, or we could see where they were making profits. Whereas venture debt is more, you know, often depends what strategy you've got. But you you might go in to um, almost back the the VC company because you know eventually they're going to put another round in. Um, so no, I think we were we were we were more aligned, and it was less about the company achieving that hockey stick and then being able to repay all the venture debt than uh, you know just the, the right kind of finance <clears throat> for the company at the time. There was a few in the recession, for example, that were in the automotive market and all the banks refused, you know, they were told you can't invest anymore in automotive. But if you can pick and choose, and especially if you can look at the aftermarket, which is always going to need service, then, you know, there was some good companies there. I should add, I also um, initiated the investment into uh, renewables at Octopus as well. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, you know, success as many parents, but I'm, I'm kind of, I'm proud of that too. That was probably ahead of the curve, I imagine. Yeah, I think we, we, you know, we did our research on the side of the kind of day job of doing these other deals. Uh, and then we, we jumped in and pushed it pretty hard. And uh, the team there and working alongside with, with Light Source as well, you know, it was a, an awful lot of hard work went into that. And then as the market kept changing, um, again, you know, the, the hard work paid off to, to be able to renegotiate solar panel prices and still make it justifiable even without feeding tariff and stuff like that. Did you find that that was quite a tough battle internally to try and get the buy-in for renewable as a concept, especially when, you know, as you mentioned, it was quite expensive at the time? Yeah, um, I think it, it was something that's, Something that's always been in the back of my mind, um, you know, there must be some kind of opportunity here. And I kind of used to bump into the founders and, and, and the other senior people on the stairwell and sort of give them my latest idea of how it might work and it's sort of no, but keep trying. Um, so eventually when feeding tariffs happened and I realized we could, we could achieve it through our tax biased funds, the EIS and VCT, it was, it was a sort of, okay, great, this now works. And I think the, you know, the, the guys at Octopus were, were good to realise that this would be, um, could be a really significant um, sector. And then my colleague, Matt, then went on to, to head that up and to, you know, really prove that success. Okay, great. So if we roll the clock forward to, to Quantex, and that's context without a U, as you yeah. kind of indicated to me. Um, what's the sort of real razor focus of context? Obviously, Southwest, any particular types of businesses, size of investment? If you could give us the overview there, Stuart. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I guess principally we've, we've boiled it down into three, we call them sectors or areas of interest, uh, which both the team has experience in and we believe the Southwest has an advantage in. So there's our enabling net zero, uh, optimizing healthcare and monetizing data. Um, the latter is really uh, a bit of a catch-all because any company right now <laughs> that isn't monetizing data should be. Um, but the, the experience of the partners are such that um, you know, uh, we would hope that we're able to provide introductions into um, the larger companies in those sectors um, that both enable us to be confident of going in earlier because we can see that we can help them get sales, uh, but also give, you know, the investee companies a lot of confidence that we're not, you know, we are genuinely going to add value. So is, uh, is there a hub down in Devon that makes it an ideal location for, uh, you know, carbon projects or um, what, where's, the, where's the alignment on that? Yeah, so 
that the, the, there hasn't been uh, sort of active risk capital throughout the southwest for probably I would say about 15 years. You know, there hasn't been a fund with a similar kind of reach. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of the natural resources in the southwest, we, we, we got a we got a lot of land. We got a which is the sunniest place in the UK, um, which you know with solar efficiency does actually make a difference. And it's one of the windiest places. Um, so there's big opportunity, you know, there's already set up infrastructure there for that. In, in terms of developments, um, as opposed to sort of one hub, we've got, you know, Bristol, Exeter, Plymouth, Falmouth, all, all lead research in, in, you know, those three areas I mentioned. Um, and, and there are other um, support bases. We, we kind of feel What's still needed is is a is a fund that's based in the region, and that will help bring in uh, the rest of the, um, the the market that's needed to to help um, high growth companies succeed. And is there an, a, an abundance of talent? Would you say, Stuart, in the region? Yeah, I think you know when we first put the research piece together as to why a fund was required for the region. Um, we were questioning that and we felt, well, what more do we need to do to increase that? And I think there, there are things we can do to increase that. But there's, you know, we, we've seen a lot of um, the right kind of opportunities um, come out of the universities, but also just in, in the local population. So we're pretty confident we're going to get enough deal flow. Um, things that will further help us, you know, post COVID, people may well choose, but if you like, like, like I've done to, to, work where they want to live and that's less you know required that they're they're in an office or meeting clients face to face regularly um so we think that's going to help um and in general we've, we've seen you know bristol's had a lot of success in the last really in the last seven or eight years um and we're hoping that one we can we can get involved in that where, where necessary um but also we're hoping that the rest of the the region can can do something similar as well so do you think, Stuart, that you've had great businesses or have great businesses like Graphcore, Exmos, I think, you know, Bristol businesses, as some of these businesses grow, evolve, exit, do you think there's potentially a flood of founders reinvesting in the region as well? I think, um, yeah, potentially. Um, so there's a, a Bristol EIS fund that's recently been launched by Harry Destacroix, um, who's one of those successful founders, and he's, he's doing everything he can to ensure that that Bristol ecosystem, um, you know, sustains itself and hopefully grows. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think there are other, you know, we, we, we've got a, quite a lot of private investor commitments um, from more if you like, traditional sources of wealth creation in the UK, you know, banking and finance and industry, uh, and they are, you know, committed to the Southwest as well. And, and they want to help enable these, these high growth businesses to, to succeed, you know, from the region and to succeed globally. Um, and the, the deals, you know, some of the deals where we've just done, we're just doing the fourth seed investment from, the Quantex Partners pre-fund launch and all of those businesses, you know, have significant potential to make national and global sales. Mm. And uh, oh, you go. on the fund strategy, are you guys looking at, you know, pre-seed, seed, are you going to follow on to Series A? Um, you know, what's, what's the idea there? Yeah, I think it, we're looking at, let's call it seed to Series A. So, Typical check size would be sort of half to one and a half million, but the scope is from 150 to 2.5 um, with with co-investment from others where it's available. And so you, you potentially will launch when, Stuart? Well, all being well, I guess um, I should probably Q4 this year. I was, I was just kind of curious, is, is you've been raising this finance through COVID? How's, how's that been? Uh, yeah, uh, I think for the, for the high or ultra high net worth investors who we need to reach, um, in some ways that's been, it's been slightly easier because they've been slightly more available. Um, 
they, the fact that we're doing this in a region where a lot of people would ideally want to live, um, again, you know, that, that goes into our favour. Uh, in terms of moving the process on, I guess these processes, they, they always take a long time. Um, so I think we, we are a similar timeline to what it would have been um, w without COVID. Okay, great. Um, and just going back a step, when you were talking about the region, we had Stephen Kelly, who's the chairperson or chairman of Tech Nation on, and I think a key thing that they're looking at in the next 12 to 18 months under his guidance is to build a type of halo effect through Tech Nation in different regions or cities around, around the country. Do you think there's already evidence of that in the Southwest or is it definitely an area that needs investment? Um, I think it's definitely an area that needs investment and it's an area that needs, it needs the, the whole of its citizenry to understand that there is this massive potential from high growth opportunities. And that needs to go into the, the, the training and skills of, of kids at school and at universities and also the encouraging in from, from, from other regions and other parts of the world to people who can really bring that advantage in. Yeah, so I think it's um, it's still the, the potential and the opportunity are both overlooked. Yeah, so would you say that local government, regional government, central government need to take a much more active leading role here? Um, I guess I've, I've always been involved with government incentivized funds. So Venture Capital Trust, the IS, they incentivize the, the individual taxpayer, um, precursors to the British Business Bank's Enterprise Capital Fund and the, the fund I ran in, in Cornwall, you know, are more, more direct government intervention. So we, we, you know, we already get a lot of that, um, you know, in, in the UK. And I think it's a great thing. I think it's essential. Um, <clears throat> I think in terms of making it all more networked so that the, the skills providers and the financiers and the policy people and the infrastructure all work together. There's, there's always room for more of that. Okay, right. All right, changing tack slightly here. Um, looking at, you know, how you find your businesses. It's always critical for the, the founders that are listening. You know, hopefully this, yeah. this will lead them to you. Um, but... You know, accelerators, I know TechSpark, Brian at TechSpark does a lot of great stuff. How, how's the network built and how do you find those hidden gems in the Southwest? Um, again, obviously, once once we have a, a, a fund up and running, I'm, I'm hoping that will be more of a, a magnet for entrepreneurs. Um, at the moment, you know, I, I've had done some work in the Southwest for the last dozen years. So I know, you know, incubators such as there are and accelerated courses that are happening and uh, the people at Set Squared have quite a big footprint in the region. Um, with the partners, um, again, we've got, you know, we, we live in the region, which helps, but we've also, Roger, one of the partners was the um, entrepreneur in residence at Exeter University. So that's helped probably unlock opportunities that we were aware were ready for commercialization um before the otherwise would have been um so it, it's a mixture really but i kind of i'm always where it's efficient i'm always open to you know having conversations with entrepreneurs my kind of view is if it's not if, if their opportunity isn't right for me or not right for me now it might be later equally if it's never then probably they have a friend or a contract contact who might be useful to and hopefully in the process, I can add some value to them as well. Okay, so when you have this extensive, well, you have had this extensive career um, meeting many, many founders. And I suppose it's that moment of, you know, where you, you sit in a meeting and, and you're, you're cringing and you're thinking, oh my God, he's, he or she is committing a death by a million pictures here. What's your 
tips for some of these founders in the southwest to, to approach you and what not to do? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess I tend to send out a relatively prescriptive, you know, here's what we're going to cover about. Please make sure you cover off these areas in this detail and leave enough time for questions because uh, people, you know, people can't but help tell you more about the product and service than you really want to know at that initial stage. Um, so, you know, you can you can make them go wrong a hundred times, but it's much easier just to set it out that this is what I want. And then that helps you keep it on track too. Um, I've had a few amusing shockers in my time and, you know, never, never tell an investor that they can't afford not to invest because um, they, <laughs> they just will out of, you know, human sort of uh, as part of the human condition that um, don't try and do demos. I remember somebody with a computer game, you know, insisting on bringing a whole desktop computer into a meeting and setting it all up. And typically it couldn't work But that. That was all this time used up, you know, you don't really need to. We don't have, need to have a good understanding of the product and service, weirdly, at the initial meeting. It's, it's interesting what you say about that, that, that we, when, whenever, well, going back to those days where we had physical events, I'd often uh, have different founders come to me and say, yes, well, we want to spend two of the five minutes that we're pitching on stage demoing the technology. And, and I'm like, but the, the people that are there to see you hear the story and, 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 and get the vision and the overall picture, if they are then interested, they will look to have a demo of the product. And also, lo and behold, whenever a founder persisted and, 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 and did the, the, the demo, along came the gremlins and lo and behold, there was a whole panic and you saw, unfortunately, that person die on stage because the spark had gone in the technology. So really good point there. And I think, you know, that's 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 about that point about positioning, you know, using the demo effectively and not just pitch events, but also in one on one meetings is really essential. So and then, you know, the other thing we would like to explore is that classic Stuart's met lots of other VCs and, and investors and where you kind of felt things could have worked a bit better. And, and you know, there's, there's a few sort of pet hates about the investment process or, or how other people do it. What, what would they be? Um, so I guess I, I got into one of the reasons I was so interested in venture capital is it's about a relationship. And therefore you can invest time in that relationship and it, you know, it, it may or may not pay off, but enough for them pay off to reinforce the value of investing in that, that time. Um, there are some people in the sector who see things as being transactional and it's sort of every, everything, anything they can do to let's say nickel and dime the entrepreneur or um, change the terms at the last minute because they know they're running out of cash, you know, and I just, I don't know. For me, life's too short. That's just too much bad karma. And then and surely it's going to bounce back in some other way, you know, whether it's by reputation or maybe it won't. Maybe that person's, you know, sitting on an island somewhere very content and wealthy. Um, but for me anyway, I just, you know, I wouldn't like to think I've done that and, uh, um, you know, hope not. To. <clears throat> Plus, I think sitting on an island somewhere is kind of overrated anyway. Yeah, yeah. Or especially when the seas are going to rise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it'd be nice to have a holiday, I suppose. You know, you kind of generally go to Ireland for holidays, don't you, really? But yeah, yeah true. That's, that's another pipe dream at the moment. <laughs> Any, anyhow, so on, on to pipe dreams or navel gazing. Um, a lot of people are obviously giving their opinions on 2021 you know, through to maybe 23, 25, the UK becoming a digital powerhouse. Obviously, you look at it through your Southwest lens, but if you were to sort of give us a more broader, I suppose, optimistic view of, of where we could be and what you think would be the drivers, um, I think the audience would love to hear that, Stuart. Sure, sure. Well, I, I don't... I don't read that much, you know, outside of what I do. I'm, I've got a curious mind, so I tend to get distracted a lot, but the sort of broad strategic piece um, 
that that others might produce. I haven't sort of read so much, but I, I think for me, I, I do the seed companies we've done. You know, with the fair winds, I can see them. You know, creating massive wealth and adding and doing a lot of good as well. Um, I like the way that society has moved into, you know, having to have a purpose and live up to that purpose. That very much sort of chimes with what I've always tried to tried to achieve. Um, we've got a massive problem in that we're stealing the oxygen for the next generations. Um, so we really need to all get together and address that. Um, so there's a big global challenge to hopefully help unify the planet. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, life has got better. Life is way better than it was 10 years ago and a lot better than it was 50 years ago, and we should be grateful for that. I don't think we... It's hard sometimes not to sit back uh, and appreciate that. Okay, and if you were, I suppose, to pick that one trend that would be, uh, I suppose, in ascendancy, would it be... ESG would it you know would it be diversity would it be women in tech what what do you think is is really going to change and grow in the next five to ten years um well I think everything still needs to be sustainable both on an economic level and on a planetary level so I think where you can combine that there's still you know our, our fund is intent on making a commercial return and we want to do good in the investments we, we do as well but but there's still you know that commercial return is still essential to our investors and i have sort of tried to be more involved in impact investing but but really there's there isn't a lot of it actually happens you know um and there's even less of it actually happens for the benefit of capturing carbon as opposed for the benefit of of making a financial return and i think that's that's the reality at the moment, unless, unless the UN changes to really taxing um, carbon or the, the, the negative externalities of, of trade at, at a, the, the correct price, that's, you know, that's not going to alter. Okay. And then how optimistic that sounded. <laughs> optimistic. I suppose, and if I, if I drill down a bit further, Stuart, um, you know, you look at, 2021 um your year ahead uh, you, clearly the fund is the driver and, you know what what do you, do you see real excitement in in the immediate future uh, yeah i mean I, I think we're at a stage with a private investor group that if we you know if we have to run a smaller fund because we don't get the government or other institutional background i think we will i think we, we've seen some great companies that are already, you know, one of them's already selling globally uh, an HR software business. Um, others are doing great research, have got a lot of grants, um, and that which should develop, you know, they have a number of pathways to, to monetizing and, and making a difference in, in healthcare. So, you know, that, I find all that really exciting. Um, and I meet, I still, I'm meeting a couple of companies a week um, that have, you know, great products, maybe not with the the growth or in the area we're looking for but yeah there's a lot of um there's a lot of hard work um and uh tempered optimism about the future for these businesses and and would you say Stuart that you're relative to other years do you think that the amount of people creating new businesses in the southwest is is on the up are you seeing more people kind of you you I suppose what you call deal flow is, is mm. getting bigger. Um, just any views there would be fantastic. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, in general, we've had a massive dislocation through COVID. Um, so a lot of people are, are either on furlough or unfortunately going to use, lose their jobs. A lot of this, this whole thing that being an entrepreneur is this sort of sexy Californian thing. But, you know, the truth of the matter is you're probably around, you know, uh, you're in our age, Anthony, you've got a few years to go yet. Um, and, you know, you can't get another job. You, you don't fit anymore or you've been made redundant. So you, you've got to find a way to make money. Mm. And sometimes that will turn into a super high growth entrepreneurial piece. Um, it might just mean you, you transfer your services into a smaller SME and that's able to grow more quickly because of that. Um, but we're not, 
we haven't really seen, you know, there's not many businesses that have come to me and said, hey, look, six months ago, we, we didn't have anything. And now, <clears throat> you know, we're ready for a million pound fundraise. That hasn't really happened. The, 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 especially the spin outs we're looking at, you know, it's 10 years of, of hard science there. And it's probably about time when they began to commercialize. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful of that. I think it's a good thing. I think any time you get a big upset like this, there's room for innovation to, to come through. There's less friction to stop it happening, um, which is all good for, you know, the, the kind of work we do. I suppose as well, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a uh, pinwheel as well, right? The more money that comes into the region, the more entrepreneurs that will build businesses and they'll kind of grow like that as well, I suppose, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and also it's about, maybe it's about less of where people are actually physically worth, but it's where, where the value gets captured. So if you have the senior management team, you know, based in uh, Somerset and spending there and buying houses there and employing people there for those purposes, then um, it doesn't so much matter that the programmers are somewhere else. It was interesting, your point, Stuart, about... Um... The, the age dynamic that um, you know, some of these the, the entrepreneurs are, are usually of a, a more seasoned variety, I suppose. Um, and I, it kind of reminded me of when I was sort of pol politely uh, booted out of the world of uh, investment banking or stockbroking. And I always remember, I think it was the head of equities at a particular unnamed uh, investment bank, um, as I don't want to be sued or anything, um, uh, saying, uh, yeah, it's a shame really, Chris, because, you know, 40 is now now the new 50. And, you know, you kind of think, uh, should, you, should you have really said that two minutes? <laughs> Where's HR? But obviously, I didn't have a leg to, to stand on at that point. But, um, but you know, it, it is interesting. So I then went off and, and created my first startup, the lovely gentleman called Fiorangelo Angelo Salvatorelli um, of, of Landstand Partners and then that led me back to Bloomberg so it, it's it's quite you know interesting how you know you can at the age we're at um, you know plus 40 you can always create you can always build you can always reset you can always grow businesses it, it shouldn't be a barrier and, you know, it's proving to you and, and, and to, to us here at Notwix, um, you know, which is obviously the second business um, that I've created, um, you know, it's doable. So, you know, it's, if, if there is going to be this massive splurge of uh, unemployment, um, I think people should look positively mm. to, to the opportunities that are out there. Yeah. One interesting aspect of uh, sort of the, the eight best age to do a startup is that when you look from an investor point of view, one of the big factors that investors usually look at is the track record, right? And if you're still very young, unless you've had a super stellar teenage work career or something, uh, you know, usually that track record isn't there yet, which obviously increases the risk unless you've got, you know, the next iPhone or something. Um, so I think that's a big aspect of it as well. Yeah, I mean, is that, I mean, I suppose, you know, is, is that something you really look at, Anthony? Track record? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And is age usually an indicator that the track record is, is going to be better? Uh, I think there is a correlation between age and track record, but a big component of that is just having the time to go and do things to have the success, um, you know. I think also, you know, it's quite interesting as well through, through some of the stuff I think we all do, that if you have got a more experienced founder or entrepreneur that they, you know, that have potentially got to series A and beyond in the past and exited, etc. There is a bit more of a, uh, a need or an understanding that uh, working with someone that can do a certain specialization for you is... Um, more of a, a, a they have more of a need for that and more of a razor focus than an understanding say like some of the work we do on a consulting side at Notbix, you know it's almost like they're like oh yeah i get that you you help us with investor relations or you can help us with scaling a business that is something i really need help on and i'm i, I really want to work with you because i know you're a specialist in that area and my specializations are elsewhere so you know and 
you know, I wouldn't say that that's a harder message to, to sell to, you know, perhaps younger or, or maybe more inexperienced founders. But there is a there's a bit of a kind of a divergence, I, I'd probably say. You know, it's, it's not always black and white, but, yeah. you know, it's something I've seen through having this consultancy that there's, there's a sort of, uh, there's a bit of a trend line there. Well, I think when you're younger, you know, you don't know what you know and what you don't know. You don't know what you're good at and what you're not good at. So you're kind of willing to try a little bit of everything. But I guess after a certain point, you just accept, yeah, it'll be quicker and better quality if I outsource this particular aspect, right? Um, okay. And it, uh, it's a good point. Yeah, I, I agree with you that. Um, so um, you touched on this earlier, Stuart, in your very nice introduction. Um, you do a lot of work for the Royal Academy of Engineers. I think that's a great institution. I've been to their lovely, um, sort of beautiful building in in cent central London. It's got that wonderful room, round room or auditorium, which I think is fantastic. And they, they, yeah. they've all done great stuff. I just wondered, you know, if I'm a London-based on, entrepreneur and I want to get into the, the the college or the engineering institute, you know, or come to some of their events. How, how's that all work and how's that all, all get put together? <clears throat> so um, my, I'm not an engineer by background. Um, I was introduced by another venture capitalist who felt I would be interested in, in the mentoring and I could, could add some value. Um, so that's my route through and I'm in effect employed by a company called Accenture. To, to be a mentor on these programs. Um, so I understand the uh, Leadership Innovation Fellowships best, which is the program I work on, but they do have other entrepreneur programs there. And, you know, I just recommend people look on the website. There's, there's plenty of free events, you know, physical if, if permitted um, or online um, about engineering and, and how, to, how to commercialize engineering um, and there's a little, there's a small hub there that, you know, if you remember, you can, you can go in and use. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great resource, which I, I commend to everyone. Okay, great. So, um, that's, that's good guidance. And then on, um, the Heropreneurs, obviously a fantastic initiative, I, I, you know, a military helping i think uh, get them into digital roles or, or, or occupations what's the the modus operandi there so it's a, it's a bit broader than that so it could be anything you you, you might want to set up a, a flower arranging business or something like that in which case we, we provide free mentoring from people who have all been entrepreneurs themselves and some of those won't have a military background they just want to give back um it's all pro bono and uh we we set that up you know online via a couple of different tools um or or in person we run online events as well to educate them so we've got one next week on crowdfunding um and we've got a, a one of our mentees employable is raising money on cedars at the moment um and uh we probably mentor probably about 70, 80 individuals at any one time. A huge mix of ages, uh, backgrounds, businesses they're trying to develop. Um, and really what annoys me a lot in the world generally is kind of inefficiency. And you, you have this hugely inefficient piece where people, veterans, leave the military and they do a, a lot the roles they end up being employed in um, are typically uh, they're using less capacity than they, they have the potential for mm. and even less than they would have done if they'd never been in the military in the first place. And that's kind of crazy. So, and if they want to achieve and set up another, you know, their own business, then again, they, I describe them like um, economic migrants. They really, they don't know the rules of business. They don't know the value of money. They don't know the value of their services. They don't understand finances and how to organize them. So typically they, they would benefit from a lot of help and somebody who's, you know, looking after their, um, uh, you know, lives in this way and either tr encouraging them not to do anything yet, if that's the sensible thing to do, 
or if they decide to proceed, just helping them as best we can. It's a, it's a great cause. And I think the multiplier effect on that is going to be tremendous as well. Um, are you sure you're not an engineer? Your efficiencies uh, uh, <laughs> statement there kind of convincing me otherwise. <laughs> no, definitely not. No, my, my, my wife wields all power tools in our house. <clears throat> and I should just add on the, on, the, on the spouses as well. Again, you know, I, I think most of the people in the military are great and they tend to have great partners and spouses. Um, and those great partners and spouses are often moved around the country, you know, every 18 months or so. They often have to uh, live on their own and look after their families on their own as their, their partners are deployed overseas. So again, there's a huge loss of, if you want to, you know, industrial capacity and opportunity for those families mm. in them not being able to sort of work at the level that they, they, they should do. And, and again, if they can run their own business from home um, and organize that well, then again, you know, that, that helps them a lot. And it is super useful when the other partner leaves the military because then they've got you know, they're kind of organized in civilian world. They probably got a house and a mortgage yeah. and a better transition like into civilian life. Yeah. 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 So we kind of, you know, hopefully we're, we're preventing problems even occurring. And I guess the long term goal, you know, I believe I believe great people should be in our military because they're more likely to do a great job. Um, and the more we're more likely to get great people joining the military if those veterans who have left have had a great experience. Mm. Um, so it's so it's a long it's a long cycle and I do believe you try and celebrate these great people that are heropreneurs um, I, I, I unfortunately missed I think your last physical celebration which I, was, yeah, was did, yeah. December but it, it has a royal endorsement I believe I, I think you do get a number of supporters from within Buckingham Palace popping down to, to to raise a glass and celebrate all those great people that you're working with. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we had the, the Kansas of Wessex um, came along last time. We had a physical um, one, which was which was good. So but should it, I say this is also, a this is a black tie celebration that you do? I think every year, usually. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this year um, we're doing them online. So um, hello sponsors, <laughs> um, and we're doing we're doing kind of one award at a time. So uh, we we've already had the um, with Warwick Business School, we have a competition for people leaving the military or spouses as well. This year we we were allowed um, to apply um, who have an entrepreneurial venture they want to get involved in, and they will give the winner a free MBA. Um, and the others some subsidized MBAs and we get a you know Warwick are really happy with the quality of um, applicants they get and the applicants are obviously over the moon that they get this education so uh, it works really well but yeah for, for other people like the, the, the new startup of the year or the, the, the sort of the larger um, high growth SME business we're we're still looking for sponsors for some of them this year. There you go. So yeah. I think um, we, well, we're definitely coming towards the end of this this great chat, Stuart. And I, I, I think I heard your dog barking in the background. So that's naturally one of your, your key loves of, of being in the location you're in and walking a dog, just like Adam Buxton, who's my one of my favourite podcasters, who I think lives down your way and always starts his podcast by walking his dog, Rosie, um, and, and sort of describing what Rosie's doing to, 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 to some nettles, which I find fascinating. But um, outside of my, my warbles, um, do, you, do you get time to watch stuff on the telly? Um, and if so... You know, what, what's, what's your favourite pick so far in lockdown? Yeah, so I probably watch more telly uh, than I ever have done in, in, in lockdown. And it's a good bit of a escapism, I guess, for, for all of us. Um, pull, up the, pull up the chair. So, um, yeah, the, the one I was surprised that I watched on Netflix is called Sensei, which is by the uh, Wilkowski twins. Is a series. Mm. Um I, th I thought that was was excellent. And you're watching that alone or with the family? I said it's one I've watched alone. 
<laughs> and it's since and how eight, are the family? Right? Are they all keeping well behaving? Yeah, uh, the word sense and then the number eight. I think it is actually was produced as a mini series a few years ago. So. Um, I, 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 I'm really happy with the, the pod, VOD. Um, Anthony, I don't know any if you have any further burning questions for Stuart. Um, no, just one, one additional thing on the Netflix. Uh, if you've not watched it, I think you'd probably really enjoy it. It's Inside Bill's Brain. Um, right. One to watch. Inside Bill's Brain. Okay. Is that yeah, the um, documentary about um, uh, the Microsoft fellow? Yeah, so it's Bill Gates um, and the Gates Foundation, and it's three episodes, but basically... Um, he's trying to work on big existential problems that society yeah. faces yeah. and each one of the episodes kind of focuses on that but there's one on there specifically about renewable energy and uh, you know revamped nuclear energy um, so yeah, yeah definitely uh, yeah I have seen it I really enjoyed it it's a good, is, good shout is that, where you, is that where you got the three ideas for Quantex from Stuart no, no, no. Um, sadly, sadly not. But um, wow. a lot of the people I, I work with, so the one of the Indian entrepreneurs I work with has got a sewage treatment plant that uses zero energy. Um, so there's, there's things. Um, I guess Bill Gates gets to do things top down and I'm trying to do my little bit bottom up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, great insights. Lovely to see you. Keep your throne warm and keep welcoming all of those Southwest <laughs> founders because I'm sure you're going to build a fantastic <clears throat> farm and yeah. you're going to make a lot of people happy down there and good luck and stay well mate. Apologies for looking so overexposed but um, that's the, the price we all have to pay for me having a decent view over the top of my uh, computer. <clears throat> good to see you mate. Thank you again. Great. Cheers. Thanks. Take care.